What a beautiful musical number. I found myself there for a second, lost in the melodies, that I almost forgot that it was my turn to stand up to the microphone and give this introduction. I am indeed humbled to stand before you today to be a part of this devotion and introduce my wife. Brothers and sisters, Talofa. Arlene Peleso was born in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and for the most part was raised in San Diego, California. At the age of 15 in 1992, she moved to American Samoa for the sole purpose of finding me. <laughs> and she did. In 1995, she graduated from Samoana High School, and in 1996, we were married. And in October of 1996, as a convert, she was baptized in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because she was thoroughly impressed by my daily example of striving to be Christ-like. She attended and continued her education at the American Samoa Community College and received her, uh, her degree there after two years and transferred here to BYU in 1997. Actually, a year later, in 1998, August 31st, after being married two years, we were sealed for time and all eternity here in the Laia White Temple. We then moved to San Diego, California, where she worked for Sony and Children's Hospital. We relocated back to Samoa in 2004, where she found employment as a system administrator for a telecoms company. Up until the time, she had this great idea that she wanted to be a teacher like I was at the time. Her third grade class quickly let her know that this was not for her. <laughs> she completed a master's degree in information system security and then pivoted back into her field of IT at the American Samoa Community College as the associate CIO and shortly after was the director of financial aid. In 2012, we moved to St. George, Utah, where she became an IT director for what was at the time Dixie State University. In 2018, we relocated uh, to Orm, where she was a product manager for BYU Provo. And in August in 2022, it seemed to all come full circle when she was offered and accepted her dream job as the chief information officer here at BYU Hawaii. Some of her other duties and responsibilities that she has had over the same time period were primary president, Relief Society president, Sunday school teacher, and I don't mean to name those, those responsibilities that she has had to, so she can receive another calling like that, but just to give you some background and some of the extracurricular things she's done. Team mom, booster club president, daughter, sister, auntie, cousin, but most important to me, my love, mom, and Oma. Oma is what our grandkids call her. We have five children and five beautiful grandchildren. We are a big football family whose mantra is faith, family, football and food. Arlene is the rock solid foundation of spirituality and faith in our family. And as a football coach, I would often put food and football above family and faith. She made sure that that was not the case. I am grateful that the Lord has blessed me beyond measure and more than I believe I'm worthy of. I often ask myself, 
How have I been blessed with such a wonderful wife? Why did she pick me? And then every morning I wake up and I look in the mirror and I say, oh, that's why. Brothers and sisters, I've been blessed with a beautiful wife the Heavenly Father has blessed me with and shared with me. And I'm just as grateful and blessed to share her with the community at BYU Hawaii. Brothers and sisters, Arlene Sewell. I'm so grateful for my husband and the balance that he brings into our lives and for his humor, sense of humor. I always say, you know, the day that he stops making me laugh is the day that I want to be separated. But, so I'm so grateful for him. <laughs> Talofa and Malo Lele, my dear brothers and sisters. I am so humbled and grateful to stand before you as a servant leader of this university. I am so grateful to be a part of this work in preparing students of Oceana and the Asian Rim to be lifelong disciples of Jesus Christ and leaders in their families, communities, chosen fields, and in the building of the kingdom of God. I am grateful to be the recipient and product of these blessings that are promised by this university's mission. I am thankful that the Tonga Club accepted to join me here today to represent our people of Oceana. 26 years since arriving as a young convert, wife, and mother of two, eager, eager to learn, I would have never imagined being on the opposite side of this podium giving this devotional talk. I am truly honored for this invitation and pray that the Spirit may dwell within our hearts and minds as I speak on a topic that has helped me navigate through some difficult times in my life. In these times of great change, the topic of faith is one that kept coming to mind as I prepared for today. In Matthew 17, 20, it says, For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. I, rem I remember reading this scripture and thinking, I wish I had the faith to move mountains. I even remember questioning if faith as small as a grain of a mustard seed can really move a mountain. I remember even asking the Lord to please help me to see and experience that faith can move mountains. This scripture has always been in my heart and mind throughout my adult life. I am grateful for the examples and acts of faith in my life, particularly the example of my mother. When I was eight years old, my parents separated and eventually divorced. My mother moved back home to American Samoa where she found herself picking up the pieces from a broken marriage. She was not prepared for this change as she thought being married and raising her children was her life. She quickly found a job at the tuna factory standing all of eight hours gutting tuna. She later was able to find employment at the hospital in the dental clinic as a secretary. She then took classes at the community college and did online courses via mail to get her certificate to become a dental assistant. It was not until I was 15 that I was reunited with my mother, and I saw for myself the hard work and sacrifices she was making. I remember in my teenage years watching my mother wake up early to say prayer, read her Bible, go to work, come home, and tend to the needs of the house, such as cooking, repairing the sink, plumbing, wash clothes by hand in buckets, and hanging them to dry. She would paint the house and always say, no matter how old the house was, if you paint it, it makes a difference. She was good at budgeting. I remember her always writing down the bills that had to be paid and what was needed for food. During school time, she would budget to take us shopping to get our uniforms and school supplies. She did all of this without complaining. I watched her give to those that came and asked for help. 
when she herself did not have much. I remember a neighbor visiting and asked my mother for money to help buy food for her grandchildren. I remember watching my mother go into her room and come back out with money that she gave to our neighbor. I remember asking my mom, why do you give when we ourselves don't have enough? She responded, if I have, I will always give because the Lord provides and he always blesses us. She was right. We always had enough. I am so grateful that my mother taught me faith through her actions. I got to witness the hand of God in her life and am able to apply it to mine. At the age of 20, I was a young wife and mother of two. I just graduated from the American Samoa Community College and was accepted to BYU in Provo and BYU Hawaii. I remember trying to decide which university to attend and felt that I needed to be closer to home and decided to attend BYU Hawaii. Hindsight of this decision, I am grateful I decided to come to BYU Hawaii because I know for sure I would have been homesick if I had chosen to go to BYU in Provo. The distance and weather would have been difficult for me. BYU Hawaii was a perfect transition from American Samoa. But coming here wasn't easy, especially in re relocating with a family. Fortunately, I was awarded an academic scholarship from the American Samoa government and BYUH that would help with the cost of school. I knew that I would need to work as well once I arrived to help with the cost of housing and help prov provide for our little family. At the time, there was no TVA apartments available for us to move in. And me being a married student, I was not allowed to move into the Hollies. But being a bit discouraged of the situation, I was considering staying home in American Samoa to just work. Fortunately, my mother-in-law started asking around in our ward if anyone had housing available around Laie. We were blessed that Auntie Oli offered her home for us to live in until TVA became available. We are forever grateful for Auntie Oli. Preparations were made, and I came first to Laia to get settled in and look for a job. My husband and my two kids stayed back with family, and we both stayed along with the help of family to pay for their airfares to join me a couple of months later. We stayed at the Fiso's house with Luana and Tassi until TVA was made available. I was able to find a job at Photopoly at PCC at the time, and my husband was able to find employment at as a full-time security guard in town at Marriott's. We juggled our schedules to make it work so we could watch our kids. A few months later, TVA was made available. In TVA, we made lifelong friends who we consider family. Being a part of the D building, family was the best. We are forever grateful to the Taliaulis, the Auteles, the Ahunas, the Levaos, and many more who became our family. We all watched each other's children and celebrated holidays together. I believe we all had babies around the same time and would, would claim there was something in the water. So in my second year here, my third child was born. I then was looking for a second job and was able to work for the Office of IT. Now I was faced with working two part-time jobs, being a full-time student, being a wife and a mother of three. But because of the example of my mother, all I knew was to keep the faith and do the work. Fast forward three years, it was my last semester here at BYUH. Our daughter, who was four at the time, was attending La Yale Elementary, came home with a note with, from the teacher that she had bumped her head on the slide. Our family was planning to go to town that weekend to do some shopping. We woke up that morning to our daughter vomiting, and she didn't have a sense of balance, and she didn't look well. We decided to take her, our daughter to the ER at Kaiser in town, along with the note that was given to us by the teacher. There they did a CT scan and an MRI scan of her head. It was then we were told that fortunately she did not have an internal bleeding of any kind, but they had found a tumor. The tumor was located in the back, of, back area of her brain. The specific medical diagnosis was cerebellar astrocytoma. This news hit us hard. 
Thoughts of cancer and losing our daughter were overwhelming. But we knew we had two other children to take care of, and so my husband and I took turns going back and forth to the hospital to be with our daughter. I remember driving home one of the nights by myself, asking Heavenly Father, why? Why our daughter? I remember pleading with Heavenly Father to please don't take her. The night before our daughter scheduled surgery on January 10, 2000, I remember holding her and she could see the worry on my face. It was then that this four-year-old reminded me to keep the faith. She held my cheek and said, don't worry, Mommy, Jesus is with me. That night, driving back to Laie, I was reminded of the story of Abraham and his son Isaac and how he was asked to sacrifice his only son. I remember thinking, is this how Abraham, Abraham felt at the time? And why was he willing to be so ob obedient? Gabriella being my only daughter, Memories of the past four years flooded my mind. My, ch my prayer changed that night. From why, and please don't take her, to a prayer of gratitude. I began to thank the Lord for allowing her to be with us for four years. I thank the Lord for her sweet spirit and for the blessing she has been in our lives. I then thanked him for the short moment we have had with her and that if he needed her back, then let his will be done. It was then that a strong feeling of peace came over me. I remember being able to finally sleep that night and waking up early to go back to the hospital for her surgery. I remember us praying as a family before she went in and the peace that we both felt as they strolled her away into the operating room. Those were the longest eight hours of our lives but we felt the power of fasting and prayer and were blessed with the outcome of her surgery going well and the tumor was benign. She didn't really need any chemo or radiation treatment. However, she needed to have physical therapy and speech therapy to regain mobility and to, she had to learn how to walk and talk again. It was a long journey, but we are grateful for the faith of all those who prayed and fasted for her. She is now 27 and still our only daughter and continues to bless our lives. I am grateful for this, this experience that set the tone of knowing faith can move mountains. Some of you are experiencing mountains of juggling work, school, family, callings, and learning a language or culture, or dealing with a personal trial. Whatever the mountains that you are facing at this time in your life, do your best and keep the faith knowing that things do come to pass. Be grateful for the opportunity that you have to rely on the Lord and what he is teaching. Another experience that testifies that faith can move mountains is experience with our son Nephi, his junior season of high school. In August of 2015, it was the start of another football season for our family. We just sent our, off our oldest son to college, and it was the next son in line to be the focus of high school football. It was the first game of the season, and on the third play, my son was in man coverage, and he broke on the ball, and the receiver was in the air. My son lowered his shoulder while the receiver was coming down, and when he hit my son, he fell straight down and couldn't get up. Being a football mom, anytime something happened to my sons, the coaches knew that I was sure to make my way down to the field. I was relieved that my son was able to stand and walk off the field, and knowing my kids, no matter how injured they are, they always try to get back into the game. I was glad to see that they took his helmet away. At the time, I believe they ruled him out of the game with a concussion. It wasn't until halftime or beginning of third quarter that my son asked if I could go with him into the locker room to take off his jersey. It was then that I noticed something was not right. He said, Mom, can you help me take off my jersey? I can't lift my arms. I quickly helped him take off his jersey and said, Son, we need to go to the hospital to get checked. I then drove him to the hospital and told, him, told them what happened, and then they started to run scans and tests on him. 
My kids know anytime we are at the hospital, I'm silently saying prayers and talking to my angels. By this time, the game was done, and my husband, who was an assistant coach at the time, joined us at the hospital. The doctor came back and showed us his x-rays of his neck and showed us that he would need to undergo major surgery. With this news, I was taken back to the time of our daughter's incident. I felt peace again, knowing we had been here before. I silently said a prayer, saying, Lord, you have worked miracles in our lives before. I know you will work miracles again. I remember that was the first time that I didn't cry. I just had this overwhelming sense of peace that I will be okay. The next morning, he was scheduled for the procedure. Again, grateful for the prayers and faith of those who were all concerned for our son, the procedure went well. That Monday, that Monday after his surgery, he was up and walking and showed signs of mobility in his hands and legs. But we're in for a long journey to full recovery. My son had his mindset that he was going to play football again. Every doctor's appointment, he would ask, Doc, when am I going to be cleared to play? We all would try our best to help him focus on just fully healing. But all Nephi focused on was getting back on the field. Each Friday night, each Friday night game, Nephi was there to support his team. But with each loss, you can see the sense of disappointment and frustration he had in not being able to help the team. Things got dark for my son, and you could see this injury was taking a toll on his spirit. I would always say to my son, just as my mother did to me, don't lose faith. I remember one of the games he called me to say that he wasn't going. This was one of those difficult weeks where he was moody. I, not wanting to deal with his attitude, was content to leave him at home and go to the game myself. But I had an overwhelming feeling to go home and check on him. When I got home and went into his room, I found him laying in the middle of the room with his room flipped upside down. I remember something telling me to just hug him. So I did, and we didn't say anything, and we just cried together. All I could say to him was how much I loved him. It was at this moment that changed my parenting to President Monson's quote, never let a problem to be solved be more important than a person to be loved. The next doctor's appointment, my son brought a piece of paper to show his doctor information about a player in the NFL that broke his neck and was still playing. We could see that he was not going to give up playing football again. The next appointment, the doctor told Nephi that he had made some calls to doctors in the NFL and that they gave him three things that would clear him to start on the road back to the game. One, solid fusion. Two, to show a range of motion. And three, he had to pass a, a cognitive exam. That was all my son wanted, needed to hear. In March 2016, seven months after his incident, he was cleared to participate in the Nike opening in Los Angeles. He was able to participate in, con in the contact list drills. This was the beginning of his road back to playing football again. Many may have thought that my husband and I were crazy to let our son play the sport again. But to us, we were grateful for the light and happiness that we saw in his demeanor because it was better than the dark cloud that was trying to consume him. We understood the risk, and he did too. We knew this was part of the journey with God and building his own faith. We have watched our son Nephi play his senior year and at the college level. He is now fulfilling his dreams of playing in the NFL. We can honestly say this is the happiest we've ever seen him. He is currently with the New Orleans Saints and we are for grateful, forever grateful for the faith he has knowing that Jesus got him no matter what. One final experience that I would like to share is one of having faith and praying for your purpose. As you prepare for your graduation, ask Heavenly Father for guidance on where you are needed next. I can testify that entering here to learn and going forth to serve has blessed my professional life. 
I have always prayed to Heavenly Father, where do you need me next? He has always answered this prayer. Looking at my resume, I can see the Lord's hand that prepared me for this current position now as the CIO for BYU Hawaii. My goal in each place I worked at was to do my best to learn, do what was required, and do it well. I was never the type to say I'm in it for the promotion or title. Some of you can relate to serving missions, to learn the culture, love the people, and do the work. This position was something that came up unexpectedly. I was working at the office of IT at BYU Provo, and we were challenged at the time by our CIO to pray for our purpose and where we fit in in the organization. I took this challenge to heart. I applied for an internal position at BYU in Provo, thinking that was the change I needed. But at the same time, I also received an email from a friend for this position that was open. He recalled, I told him that I would love to be the CIO of BYU Hawaii someday. I let the email sit for about a week. The more I prayed, the more I just felt to apply. So I did, and to much surprise, I got a call the same week asking me how interested I was in moving to Hawaii and in the, this position. I was then fortunate to get a call to schedule my first interview and then my second interview. By this time, I, I thought I better let my husband know. <laughs> I told him that if I make the finals, that we would be flown out to Latia for a couple of days. And even if I don't get the job, at least we were able to get a free trip to Hawaii. When we arrived here, I was called to remembrance and gratitude. Memories of our time here and the special spirit that is felt here filled my heart. Meeting my future team and my interviews felt right. But I was torn with the responsibilities of taking care of my mother, the distance from my children and my grandchildren, and missing out on my youngest son's last collegiate football games. On the second day of interviews, I woke up early to go running. I remember sitting in front of the temple and was torn on how this decision would affect my family, especially my youngest son. As my husband and I, we have supported all of our sons being present at all of their games. As I sat in front of the temple, I thought, Lord, if you need me here, Please help me to balance my time with my son, and please help me to provide for my mother and take care of all that is needed. When I got back to the guest house, I checked my phone, and there was a text from my son saying that he supported me and wanted me to be happy. In my last interview, knowing the sacrifice that would be made, I asked a team to pray for me and for them to know if I am the right fit for this position. Upon returning to Utah, the next person that I needed to talk to was my mother. I wasn't sure if she would be open to moving, but after family prayer, it was to my surprise that my mother was open to moving to Hawaii if I got the job. The final challenge was how my husband and I were going to make things work with him staying back in Utah to finish his, his coaching season as a head coach for Orem. At the time, we thought three months, ah, small kind, right? It would be no problem being away from each other. Let's just say we are never doing that again. <laughs> Throughout that time, I stayed in touch with VP Kevin Slag. We wanted to make sure that I was all in if I was given the opportunity. Later that month, I received the call and was offered the position to serve as a new CIO. What a wonderful opportunity to have been here as a student that entered to learn gone forth to serve, and now return to give back. With much prayer and thought, my husband and I felt that it was the right decision. It may not have made logical sense, but it made spiritual sense. It was then the end of July, and things were set in motion. Packing and reloc relocation began. My official start date was September 1st. My mother, daughter, and I were packed and on a plane to start our new journey here. We were all excited for this next chapter. When we arrived, I didn't have much time to settle and was quickly reminded of some of the challenges in returning to island life on the North Shore. 
So I had a two week adjustment of unpacking, getting settled, and adjusting to how far things are from La Ye. Then I received the news that my sister had passed in American Samoa. Losing a sibling was unexpected and it didn't really hit me until I got back from her funeral that she was no longer here with us. October and November came and the separation from my husband was easier said than done, as we agreed on, but we made it work. As the African Proverbs state, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Then in December, I received the news of my father's passing. I just got back from the trip that I made to reunite with my husband. We understand that death is a part of living, but when my father passed, I was not prepared for the unexpected grief that I felt. This experience knocked me off my core. Many people know me as a smiley person, and I could smile through a lot of things. But this time, I could not smile. Losing a parent is something that we know will eventually happen. But until it happens, you don't realize how much a part of you feels empty. I want to thank my Heavenly Father, I mean, I want to thank my husband who held it together for me and was patient with me and let me grieve. I'm grateful that I witnessed miracles during my time of grief. The veil is truly thin. I again see the Lord's hand in my life knowing that I needed to be here at this time. Losing loved ones is hard. I could see how some struggle to get past it. I am truly grateful that the Lord has given me this opportunity to be here. Being here to celebrate the new year was truly a blessing. Walking around that year with my daughter that night was what I needed to get out of the funk I was in of losing loved ones. I wanted to thank, I want to thank the community for the beautiful Full display of fireworks to welcome the new year. That day reminded me that this is how each day should be celebrated. We should all wake up each day excited to start anew. Whatever was done yesterday was yesterday. Today is a new day. As Sister Joy D. Jones, the 13th President, General President of Primary, stated, the Lord loves effort and effort brings rewards. We, we keep practicing, we are always progressing, as long as we are striving to follow the Lord. He doesn't expect perfection today. We keep climbing our personal Mount Sinai. In times of past, our journey does indeed take effort, hard work, and study, but our commitment to, pro to progress brings eternal rewards. My dear brothers and sisters, I hope that these experiences will inspire you to keep the faith. Whatever mountains you are facing, let God prevail. Call upon Jesus' name and your angels. Faith can move mountains. Remember, you only need faith the size of a mustard seed. I testify to you that is it that it is by small and simple things are great things brought to pass. Peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thy affliction shall be but a small moment. In closing, I would like to leave with you quoting Andre de Shield's cardinal rules. One, surround yourself with people whose eyes light up when, you, when they see you coming. Two, slowly is the fastest way to get where you want to be. And three, the top of one mountain is the bottom of the next, so keep, keep climbing. I testify these things to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.